You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Before the Tet Offensive, South Vietnam was experiencing a rather difficult period with a great deal of political instability and several coups, especially after the coup in 1963. By 1966, the situation began to show signs of improvement when South Vietnam's top leaders, head of state Nguyen Van Thieu and Prime Minister Nguyen Sao Kyi, agreed to attempt to establish a democracy. They committed to making the government more democratic at a meeting in Honolulu, aiming to stabilize the political environment. Before the year 1967 began, they were occupied with drafting a new constitution and preparing for elections. After the presidential election in 1967, there was a noticeable shift in the atmosphere. The constant infighting among South Vietnam's generals began to decrease, and Thieu and Ki chose to unite for the election. Even as North Vietnam attempted to disrupt the process, the elections witnessed a surprisingly high voter turnout. This was significant because it appeared that South Vietnam was finally making progress towards a more democratic regime after years of chaos and coups. On the contrary, the leadership of the Communist Party of Vietnam, with a prominent leader being Le Duan, incorrectly believed that the busy election period and the protests represented an ideal opportunity for a general uprising against the government of South Vietnam. They assumed that what they perceived as ongoing instability could be exploited to maintain South Vietnam's political fragility. In the latter part of 1967, the effectiveness of the United States' strategy in South Vietnam was a significant question for both the American people and President Lyndon B. Johnson's administration. General William C. Westmoreland, heading the Military Assistance Command in Vietnam, was optimistic that reaching a crossover point, where the number of communist soldiers killed or captured surpassed new recruits, would result in a victory for the U.S. Yet there were conflicting reports about the strength of Viet Cong guerrillas. In September, intelligence officials from the Military Assistance Command and the Central Intelligence Agency came together to create a special national intelligence estimate to aid in assessing the U.S.'s progress in the war. Thanks to intelligence obtained from Operation Cedar Falls and Junction City, CIA analysts estimated the Viet Cong strength could be as high as 430,000, contrasting with the military command's estimate of no more than 300,000. Westmoreland was concerned about the American public's reaction to this higher number, since communist troop strength was a frequent topic at press briefings. General Joseph A. McChristian, military command's intelligence chief, was apprehensive that the higher figures would be perceived as evidence that North Vietnam had the capability and willingness to continue a prolonged war of attrition. By May, there was an effort by the military command to minimize the numbers, arguing that Viet Cong militias were not significant combat forces. Still, the CIA countered this by emphasizing their responsibility for numerous U.S. casualties. With neither side willing to yield, George Carver, a CIA deputy director, suggested a compromise where the agency would not count the irregulars in their final estimates but would include a detailed explanation of their position. George Allen, a deputy to Carver, attributed this decision to CIA Director Richard Helm, suggesting it was made to avoid contradicting the administration's policies. By the end of 1967, the administration was increasingly worried due to criticisms and waning public support for the war effort. Opinion polls showed a rise in the number of Americans who thought the involvement in Vietnam was a mistake, increasing from 25% in 1965 to 45% by December 1967. However, a significant number of Americans also expressed a desire for a more aggressive war policy. This prompted the administration to launch a success offensive to alter the perception that the war was at a stalemate and to highlight their progress. National Security Advisor Walt W. Rostov led this campaign, which involved sharing positive war statistics with the press and Congress. Vice President Hubert H. Humphrey and others made public declarations of progress and optimism. Furthermore, a policy review in Washington saw General Westminster and Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker reinforcing claims of U.S. successes, including the effectiveness of the pacification program, which, according to official reports, had brought a significant portion of the South Vietnamese population under Saigon's control. General Bruce Palmer Jr. also contributed to this narrative by declaring a defeat of the Viet Cong in certain areas. At a National Press Club address, General Westmoreland confidently proclaimed that the communists were losing, 
signaling what he believed was the start of the end of the conflict. This optimistically framed campaign seemed to have some effect, as the administration's approval rating saw a slight increase by the year's end. However, a Gallup poll in early January revealed that nearly half of the American public was still not convinced of the president's management of the war, adopting a wait-and-see attitude. Westmoreland nonetheless boldly invited the communists to engage, indicating a readiness for combat. In early 1967, planning began in Hanoi for an offensive in the winter and spring of 1968, discussions that continued into the next year. American sources point out a noticeable reluctance among Vietnamese historians to delve into the decision-making behind this widespread offensive, even many years later. Official accounts in Vietnam often describe the decision for the Tet Offensive as a reaction to America's failure to secure a quick victory, the ineffectiveness of American bombing in North Vietnam, and the growing anti-war feelings in the United States. Yet, the truth is the planning behind the offensive was much more nuanced. This decision concluded a long and heated internal debate among North Vietnamese leaders, stretching back over a decade. It involved factions with differing views, moderates who prioritized North Vietnam's economic health and advocated for a peaceful reunification with the South, aligning with Soviet strategies and militants who pushed for reunification through military force, rejecting negotiations, influenced by China's approach. Notable figures like Truong Chin, Vong Guyen Giap, Le Duan, and Le Duc Tho played crucial roles in these discussions, with the militants, led by Le Duan and others, shaping war tactics in South Vietnam for much of the early to mid-1960s. By the time 1966 to 1967 arrived, heavy losses, a stalemate, and devastating bombings forced a rethink in Hanoi. The reality that they might run out of resources sparked a push, especially among moderates, for negotiations and a shift back to guerrilla warfare tactics, believing that the United States could be gradually worn out. The tough battlefield conditions even led Le Duan to order the incorporation of guerrilla warfare strategies. During this pivotal period, a third stance emerged, led by President Ho Chi Minh and others, advocating for negotiation. A notable public debate unfolded between military figures over the best strategy to pursue, highlighting differences between those favoring traditional guerrilla methods and others pushing for a continuation of the more direct military engagement. Foreign policy considerations also played a critical role, as North Vietnam depended heavily on support from China and the Soviet Union, each promoting divergent strategies and objectives. While China feared the consequences of conventional warfare and opposed negotiation, the Soviet Union supported talks but provided the means for traditional warfare. In a move to assert control and set a definitive course, on the 27th of July, 1967, North Vietnam witnessed the arrest of numerous pro-Soviet moderates in what became known as the Revisionist Anti-Party Affair, targeting those opposed to the Politburo's tactics and strategy for the coming offensive. This action solidified the militants' plan, rejecting peace talks, moving away from a prolonged guerrilla campaign, and focusing on urban offensive operations, with further arrests reinforcing their stance in the months that followed. The strategy behind the major offensive and uprising, known as the COSVN Proposal, was initially crafted at Tan's southern headquarters in April 1967, and by the next month it was presented to Hanoi. The general was summoned to the capital to discuss his idea face-to-face -face with the Military Central Commission. In July, Tan shared the details of his plan with the Politburo. On July 6, right after getting the green light to start planning the offensive, Tan passed away from a heart attack at a party allegedly after overindulging. There's another version of the story, though, suggesting Tan actually died from injuries caused by a U.S. bombing raid on COSVN after being moved from Cambodia. Post-crackdown, the militants accelerated their efforts to organize a significant conventional offensive aimed at ending the military stalemate. They were convinced the Saigon administration and the U.S. presence were deeply unpopular among South Vietnam's population believing that a widespread attack would trigger a massive uprising. This confidence stemmed from their assessment that the South Vietnamese military was ineffective, dissatisfaction evident in the 1967 presidential election results where the Thieu Key ticket garnered only 24% of the vote, the Buddhist crises, anti-war protests in Saigon, and regular critique of the Thieu government in the press. 
The initiative sought to silence various calls for peace talks, critiques of military strategies and foreign pressures. In October, the Politburo marked the Tet holiday for the offensive, reaffirming this decision in December and officially endorsing it during the Party Central Committee's 14th plenary session in January 1968. This decision, encapsulated in Resolution 14, aimed to crush both domestic and international opposition, suggesting negotiations could happen, yet primarily focusing on sparking a swift, decisive victory through a spontaneous uprising. General Jap is often mistakenly credited with planning the offensive, but it was actually based on Tan's initial strategy, further developed by Tan's deputy, Pam Hung, and later adjusted by Jap. A Jap, possibly under pressure after the arrest of his colleagues during the revisionist anti-communist party affair, took on the task. While the Politburo had already approved the offensive, Jap's role was to integrate guerrilla tactics into a more traditional military offensive shifting the responsibility for initiating the uprising to the Viet Cong. The PAVN official records describe the Tet Offensive's goals as destroying a large part of the South Vietnamese Army, overturning the puppet regime, crushing the American military spirit, and consequently pushing the U.S. towards defeat, thereby achieving the revolution's immediate aims, independence, democracy, peace, and neutrality, with an eye towards peace and national unification. Strategically, the offensive was to start with diversionary attacks to distract American forces, then launch simultaneous assaults on major bases and urban areas, notably Saigon and Hue, along with a significant threat against the USK San combat base. Jap saw these actions as necessary to protect supply lines and divert U.S. attention. The overall aim was to weaken the South Vietnamese military and government through a popular revolt, affecting South Vietnamese public opinion more than that of the U.S. The extent to which the offensive hoped to influence U.S. political events remains a subject of debate. As outlined by General Tran Van Tra, the offensive would unfold in three phases, starting with a nationwide assault on January 30th, aiming for an outright victory or at least paving the way for a coalition government and American withdrawal. If initial goals weren't met, subsequent operations would seek to wear down the enemy towards a negotiated peace. Troop movements and logistical preparations began mid-year, with significant supplies and troops making their way south via the Ho Chi Minh Trail, arming the Viet Cong with more powerful weapons. Hanoi attempted to obscure its intentions through a diplomatic offensive, suggesting willingness to negotiate if the U.S. ended its bombing campaign, sparking a last-minute flurry of diplomatic efforts. Intelligence from South Vietnam and the U.S. estimated PAVN VC forces at 323,000 men, including regulars, Viet Cong, and support personnel, organized into a formidable force, ready for the expansive and strategic operations planned for the offensive. In Saigon, intelligence teams from both the United States and South Vietnam began to pick up on hints that the communists were gearing up for a big move in late 1967. Agencies noted a significant change in the enemy's strategies, and by December evidence was piling up that suggested a major offensive was in the works. One of the clear indicators was the spike in activity along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, where the number of trucks observed increased dramatically from 480 per month to 6,315 in December. General Westmoreland, sensing the buildup, warned Washington on the 20th of December of an expected intense campaign by the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong over a short period. Despite these clues, the scale of the Tet Offensive caught the Allies off guard. The key issue was the way intelligence assessed the situation. Army Republic of Vietnam. Colonel Huang Ngoc Lung pointed out that the Allies focused on what they thought the enemy was capable of, not what their plans were. This, combined with a lack of coordination among intelligence teams, meant that even if the complete battle plan had been presented, it would have likely been dismissed as unbelievable. In a series of preparatory moves, the North Vietnamese engaged U.S. and South Vietnamese forces in various locations. Notable were the repeated assaults on border positions, including the premature engagement at Khe San in April, and continuous shelling at Cantine prompting an extensive bombing campaign by Westmoreland called Operation Neutralize. Attacks at Song Bi and Lok Ninh, followed by a major engagement at Dok Tu, drew U.S. attention and resources to the borders, part of the North's strategy to divert forces from the cities. The focus on Khe San intensified, 
with Westmoreland deploying a large force to counter an estimated 20,000 to 40,000 People's Army of Vietnam troops. This focus on Khe San was so central that Lieutenant General Frederick Weyand, with suspicions of broader communist plans, convinced Westmoreland to reposition forces closer to Saigon in early January. This redeployment, bringing 27 Allied battalions to defend Saigon and its surroundings, was a crucial move in the face of the coming offensive. At the start of January 1968, the United States had a significant military presence in South Vietnam. With over 331,000 Army personnel and nearly 78,000 Marines, this force was supported by international allies, including Australian, Thai, and South Korean forces, along with a large contingent of South Vietnamese regular and militia forces. Despite this formidable presence, the mood among the Allied forces was relatively relaxed as the Tet holiday approached, with the enemy announcing a truce that led to a decrease in military readiness. The South Vietnamese government, under President Thieu, had scaled back the truce to just 36 hours despite U.S. General Westmoreland's efforts to cancel the ceasefire altogether, citing concerns that it might boost enemy morale. In an alarming prelude to the offensive, 11 Viet Cong operatives were caught with messages for the already occupied cities of Saigon, Hue, and Da Nang, signaling an imminent threat that was not fully appreciated by the Allies. On the eve of the offensive, U.S. intelligence officers were so unaware of the threat that they attended a pool party in Saigon. However, James Meacham, a military analyst, noted the complete surprise among the officers about the impending Tet Offensive. Moreover, even though General Westmoreland had warned U.S. leadership of potential widespread attacks, his warnings were so cautiously phrased that they didn't prompt the needed preparation or concern. In contrast, General Weyand was more forthcoming about the threat even briefing journalists on the possibility of a major attack around Tet, noting that respect for the holiday might prevent attacks during Tet, but indicating an imminent threat before or just after. Weyand had strategically moved troops closer to Saigon in anticipation, showing a level of concern and preparation that was unfortunately not widespread among all Allied commanders or their troops. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.